Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Anne Rogers. I'm chairman of the Project Management Society. And I'd like to welcome you all to this morning's event. Um, just to take care of the housekeeping, first of all, the um, emergency exit is through the door. We just came in here and on the right. Um, so this morning's event on lessons learned um, is sponsored by Lafferty Project Managers. And um, we would just like to say we thank them for their kind sponsorship and um, they uh, paid for breakfast, so hope you all enjoyed it. Um, basically, we welcome sponsorship here um, in, for the project management event. So if any company would be interested in sponsoring future events, please let me know. Um, just to let you know a little bit about the Project Management Society uh, here in Engineers Ireland, um, we run a number of events. Um, they run from September through to June. And um, if you're interested in finding, get, finding out about the events or indeed in receiving notification of them, um, if you go onto your membership webpage and just tick the box for the Project Management Society, you will receive notifications. Um, so um, the other thing just to let you know about the next event that we'll be holding here um, will be in the evening event on the 11th of May. And um, it's a project management showcase whereby um, project management providers will be here. Um, they'll be available for you to talk to, to find out about the content of the courses they provide and indeed the qualifications you get if you complete the course. Um, also, following that, that will take place from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock on the 11th of May. And after that, we have uh, John McGrath of um, DIT Anger Street, who lectures in project management. And um, he'll be providing um, a presentation on developing project management excellence. So, just to tell you a little bit now about our presenter today, um, it's... Um, his name is J.P. Hilliard, and um, I have to refer to his information. It's quite a bit of background here. Um, he's an associate director in Lafferty Project Managers with over 22 years' experience. Uh, J.P. is a certified senior project manager, a member of Engineers Ireland, and a chartered member of the uh, Chartered Institute of Buildings. J.P. is a part-time lecturer in Trinity College, Dublin, um, on the Postgraduate Project Management Diploma course since 2013 and is an active committee member in Engineers Ireland Project Management Society. JP re regularly presents keynote speeches at events such as the Project Management Summit, uh, the National Construction Summit and within Engineers Ireland. Um, he's worked on extensive, uh, for an extensive client base both in uh, private and public sectors and across a wide variety of industry sectors, including commercial, residential, mixed use, education, office fit out, distressed assets, telecommunication rollouts, and data centers. Um, JP was the lead project manager and employer's representative um, on many challenging blue chip projects in Ireland and the Middle East. Clients include um, ESAP BT, Department of Education and Skills, Aircom, and various education and training boards. Um, also, Trinity College Dublin, NUIG, UCD, MTT, Siemens, and many, many more. Um, JP was also the lead project manager for Aircom's award-winning HQ building, the oval development, refurbishment of Cumberland House, redevelopment of the ESB's headquarters, and is the current lead project manager for the redevelopment of Blanchetown Shopping Centre and the refurbishment of the Arts Building in Trinity College Dublin. And so, without further ado, I introduce you to J.P. Hilliard. Okay. Thanks very much, Anne. Um, I don't know where I start from there. Uh, maybe I should just go home. Um, very good introduction. Thank you. Um, it's great to see big numbers here today. It's, uh, it's a short week for us all, um, with Easter coming up. So thanks for taking the time and effort to come along today. Um, just a couple of things before we launch into the into the slideshow. Um, I'll try and finish up by certainly no later than nine o'clock. Um, it should take about 40, 45 minutes to get through the slides, of which there are a fair few. Um, 
just to bring you up to speed a little bit on, on the project, um, as I say, the this presentation has been put together today with the input from the full team. So when I say the full team, we've had input from the client, uh, the landlord, the tenants, um, and the full project team. So there's a lot of information in here and intertwined in the presentation from um, all persons within the project team, not just from my own perspective. So that's, that's good. Um, one of the main purposes for this lecture as well today is not to not to seek to be controversial or to be sensationalist. It's just to maybe give you a glimpse of some of the issues that we faced on the project and some of the hurdles that we had to overcome to successfully deliver it that you may take into a future project. So I don't know about you, but any presentation I go to, if I you know if there's five or six takeaways from it, I believe that that's a good presentation and a good talk. So hopefully from today you'll take away maybe five or six points at the end. Um, there's probably about 500 points within the presentation, but if you can remember five or six, uh, that, that would be good. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we might just start into the presentation proper. So as you see, there's an image of the completed development on the screen. So moving on, just some images from Lafferty Project Managers and some of our previous projects we've completed. I'm not gonna dwell on them. They're, they're up there and they're on the banners. So I will move swiftly on. Okay, so <clears throat> some of the, the, the structure to the lecture this morning. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the project background. And this is a tricky enough lecture to give in that yes, it's about lessons learned, but to try and frame and contextualize the lessons learned, I have to give you some facts about the project as we go. So <clears throat> whilst every slide won't be necessarily specific lessons learned, there will be facts uh, there as well, just to give you some background to the project, okay? <clears throat> Okay, so <clears throat> that's what Cumberland House looked like back in August 2016 and for 20 or 25 years before then. Um, Aircom were the incumbent tenant uh, up on the fourth and fifth floor, I think it was. But as you can see, the building was in need of serious refurbishment uh, before Hibernia Reed and, and Twitter came on board. So the image on the right, um, that's just after we had started demolition, uh, of which we had significant internal demolition uh, of cores and floors um, toilet blocks, et cetera, et cetera, to carry out. So again, just to give you a little bit of the background to the project and uh, the task that we all faced. So moving on, this is what we ended up with um, on September the 9th, 2016. Um, <clears throat> so we ended up with a, a brand new building for Hibernia Reach to take over um, as the landlord, Twitter, occupied the lower ground floor, ground floor, first, second, third and fourth. Um, and subsequently the fifth and sixth floor was sublet to a company called NTT. So as you can see on the right hand side, we ended up with what I believe was a fantastic fit out. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the detail of that as we proceed through the lecture. So just some more images as well, just to give you an idea of um, what we actually produced as a team um, on project completion. That's the, the main reception area on the top. And on the bottom is a standard, if you want to call it that, um, section through an office floor plate. So that's part of the team, only part of the team on, on PC. So the, the cert had just been handed over probably 10 minutes before that. So there was a lot of uh, grateful and thankful people there in that picture, um, all looking to collapse after that and head home or head to the pub or head somewhere. So, okay, so some facts about the project. So as I said, the client was Hibernia Reef PLC. The main tenant was Twitter. Uh, the scale was over 13,000 square meters. The budget was 34 million uh, at the outset, and the design team comprised of Michael Collins as the architect, um, ourselves as the project managers, Lafferty. ME engineers were Metech, Civil Structural, KCR O'Rourke, uh, KSN were the QSs, Michael Slattery was the fire consultant, the assigned and design certifier, I3PT, PSDP, ASHU, and the lead consultant was O'Connor Sutton Cronin, and obviously Flynn Management Contractors were the, the main party to deliver the contractor, okay? So again, just some more facts before we launch into the lessons learned. So in effect, it was an 11 month program. So just to give you a little bit of the background, um, McAllen Brothers uh, were the demolition contractors who preceded Flynn Management Contractors on the main project. So they were on site um, in early July, 2015 with a significant demolitions works program. Um, and then following on from when they completed out Flynn Management Contractors came on board on the 12th of October. So. It was a significant project with, as I said at the start, a lot of structural internal demolitions, a lot of new build elements, obviously a total refurbishment of the complete building, 
um, right up to cat B standard, okay? Um, the, the fourth paragraph down there, just in terms of the primary project objective, it's, it's, it's good to sort of get that out there at the moment because the real driver for this project was, you know, the occupation by Twitter for the 1st of September 2016. That was the primary project objective for everybody. You know, there was a commercial uh, transaction which had been completed, which meant that that date had to be achieved. So everybody was very, very clear from the outset that this was, um, this was the main deliverable for the project, notwithstanding, you know, the requirements to deliver a quality building uh, within budget, et cetera, et cetera. But the primary project objective was, was program. Uh, as we see later on, that had, that had uh, subsequent knock-on impacts on the project. Um, I'll, I'll keep moving on. So some of the topics that I'm going to try and cover today, um, and some of them are going to have to be at a fair bit of pace because there's a lot of slides up here. Um, so the first thing that we're going to try and do is we're going to talk about the project structure, teamwork, project governance, stakeholder management, a high performance team. And then we'll start getting into the uh, maybe the meatier slides, let's call it that, on health and safety, statutory approvals, a little bit about sustainability. There's a good few slides on the refurbishment of a, of a 1970s building because um, there's a lot of specifics related to this building and 1970s building stock that we encountered and that we had to overcome on the project. So um, I'd like to think that um, they're very important points and you might certainly take your, your top five tips um, out of those slides if you're involved in any other 1970s type building refurbs around the city at the moment. Construction, we have a number of slides on construction as you would expect, some slides on contract and cost management. Um, program, yes, we have a slide or two on program, but to be honest, my discussions on program will probably be right throughout the, the presentation. <coughs> then we'll have a little bit about operation and end user requirements, um, and then a close out slide with miscellaneous lessons learned. Um, and I should say there as well, we've got a couple of slides in from the tenants in terms of their feedback on the project. So we're trying to get feedback from all the stakeholders to the project to feed into this presentation because it would be too easy for me to get up here from a project management perspective and just give my view on life. As we all know, you know, the perception of a successful project varies depending on who you are um, as, as a stakeholder. So it's good to get the input from everybody um, as part of the project team. Okay, we'll move on. So I suppose the first question I asked myself when I was putting this together is, you know, why, why are we interested in lessons learned? Um, why, why, should we, why should I get up here uh, and give a talk on it? And why might people be interested in actually listening to it? So the second question I asked was why, why would we use Cumberland House as a case study? Well, I suppose first and foremost, uh, in my view, and probably in the view I think of the project team, it was a significant, a very significant project achievement. It had a lot of different elements to it, um, and certainly there's a lot of lessons learned in it. So from my perspective, it fitted in nicely with the, with the, um, with the presentation topic. So a <clears throat> couple of points on lessons learned. So, as we're all very busy out there working on various different projects, irrespective of what discipline you work in, um, we often just move from project to project and we don't often get the time to pause at the end of a project and try and actually decipher and digest what did we do right, what did we do wrong, what, what can we improve on next time. So that's, that's one of my first reasons for giving this talk today. And actually within Lafferty, we do carry out a lessons learned exercise at the end of all projects, typically within four to six weeks of PC where we do document in-house what we did well, what we did wrong, and what we can try and improve on, and we try and share that amongst our colleagues. So that's, that's another reason why I'm up here talking today. Um, again, stating the obvious, I think we can all learn from our, our good and bad experiences, and in my own view, we probably learn more from uh, complex, challenging projects than we do from the projects that seemingly go very well. So that's another reason why I think we're, uh, why, why I'm up here today. Um, and as well, it depends on where, where, where people are in their various organisations, but most of us probably have a responsibility to um, manage other staff, coach staff, mentor staff. Um, and I think from a lessons learned perspective, there's a lot in the projects that you may have learned from, that you may have encountered, that you can pass on that knowledge and expertise to one of your uh, possibly more junior colleagues who will actually, when they come across that next time, they may know, they may know what to do or they may know to actually come to you too to consult with you, so that's another reason why uh, I think lessons learned are important. So, moving on, so just to give you an idea of the project structure, um, and it's great to see a lot of the project team here today, so they'll be tired looking at this, but for, for people who aren't aware of the project, so obviously the landlord was Hibernia Reit uh, and the client, tenant was Twitter, who were very much involved in the project from the outset, 
ourselves were the PMs and it's the full team down the bottom which I've gone through. So it's just to graphically present uh, who the team was, okay? Okay, moving on. So um, <clears throat> the first slide, I, I, I just thought <clears throat> I'd start off with something uh, a little bit softer before we launch into the hard facts of the project. So in, in my view, and I think in the view of probably a lot of the, the, the senior people on the project that the single biggest reason for the success of the project was good teamwork and collaboration. Now, um, that may seem a little bit corny and a bit cliched, um, and you could take that view, but uh, within this project, we had buy-in and we had active involvement from the senior people right across the design team, right across the client's uh, body and across the tenant body. And when I say involvement, I don't mean dip it in out of the project one or two days a week. These people, these senior directors were always available at all the workshops, at all the meetings, right through for, for a full year for the project. Um, and I'm firmly of the view that the project wouldn't have got delivered without that full senior management involvement in the project on a daily basis. Um, I'm not saying you will achieve that on all projects. Uh, it does depend on the project, but I think we all realized on this project from the get-go that the challenge, particularly program-wise, was, was massive. And I think we were all, I know I was worried from the start that uh, <coughs> we had no chance of getting there. So uh, it was great to get senior director involvement from the start right through, right through the, uh, the project team. Um, and then collaboration is the other thing as well. So the important point here, which we'll touch on later on, and, and one of the nuances of this project was that we had the same project team um, appointed for the landlord team and the tenant team, which in my view is quite unusual. Um, and I know the legal people who were involved in the project were a little bit concerned uh, how this might work out with colleague A talking to colleague B and writing uh, instructions and uh, sending in claims to, to your colleague to deal with. But I would say, um, in hindsight, which is great, it was another critical success factor for this project because we didn't have the same project team um, of consultants on the landlord and tenant side. I, I definitely don't think we would have achieved PC. I think we would have been weeks out, if not maybe a month or two out. So I think that was very important. But the fact that we had the same team on both sides of the house engendered good collaboration on a daily basis across all issues and there was a, a real can-do attitude to actually solving issues. So moving on to project governance. So as I've just said there, I've touched on the first bullet point there about senior level personnel involved, so I won't dwell on that. Um, it was clear the roles and responsibilities of everybody in the project from the outset, uh, which on some projects can be a bit blurred, um, but certainly from my own perspective, the direction that I received from the client, Hibernia Reed, was very clear from the get-go. They were very involved, and everybody was, was under no illusion as to what your role on the project was to deliver. So that was very, very helpful. Um, I've touched on this somewhat, but decision makers were in attendance at all meetings. Um, I know that, um, as certainly as a project manager, you don't always have the time to go to all the workshops that are on. There might be a structure, structural workshop, there might be a facade workshop. You just don't simply have the time, generally, in your working week to get to them all. Um, but the good thing about this project was there were decision makers from all organizations at those meetings to make decisions and move on. We didn't have the luxury of time to wait a week or two or 10 days for someone to make a decision. That simply just wasn't gonna work. So that was clear from the outset as well. Um, and project reporting and schedule of meetings from a, from a PM perspective, again, very focused on program. What did we have to deliver? Um, what were the legal requirements? What was in the AFL, which was a very important document on this project? What was in the building contract and how were they gelled together? So. Um, we were very directed in terms of our project reporting and meetings, but we were also some, so, somewhat flexible, understanding the pressures everybody was under. So that's just a little bit about project governance. Stakeholder management, um, if any of you know the, the location uh, of where Cumberland House is, it's, it's surrounded by residential properties, it's surrounded by um, some hotels, um, a lot of commercial uh, proprietors as well. So we had, we had our work cut out from the start, um, and um, I would say from the get-go, um, and particularly from Flynn's, I have to say Flynn's drove this from the very start in a, in a very positive way. Effective and real stakeholder management, not a stakeholder management plan that's written on a document or a template and thrown, thrown in your drawer. This was actually real stakeholder management on the ground. A directed person from Flynn's, Big Flynn, who's probably up in the audience there, was the key person who consulted with all of the local residents on a daily basis. We set up a forum on a monthly basis to meet with these people and try and keep their concerns, you know, um, we tried to listen to them and we tried to assuage them as much as we could. Very difficult, we did a very difficult program to meet 
I had the contractor under pressure, the landlord had myself under pressure, but we still had to, you know, show a little bit of empathy to the local residents and try and work with them in terms of possibly moving delivery times. Um, when are we going to pile? When are we not going to pile? What's the situation with noise? So there was a very active stakeholder management um, plan implemented on this project rather than just a report or a template done and, and, and put in the drawer. It actually happened on this project, which was very, very good. Um, one or two of the last bullet points there as well. Strict site rules. Um, I'm, I'm sure we've all had the experience where we've, we've been on site and we've walked down to the local coffee shop or the local spa to get a cup of coffee or get a, you know, a muffin or whatever. And we, we pass a number of site personnel on the way and no disrespect to site personnel, but sometimes uh, the carry on of the language can be a little bit colorful. <laughs> um, but I would say on this project from the get go, there were strict site rules for all people on site and people leaving site to go to the local shops because it just wasn't appropriate um, to be conversing in the way that sometimes, I wouldn't say all people, but sometimes carry on on site can carry on down to the local shops. But this was, a, this was a very strict site rule. It was implemented, I actually saw it in place myself, and it meant that the local residents who actually used these shops as well, who were the same people we were meeting on a weekly basis, understood that you know, this was a package of a project that we were delivering. It involved everybody on the site, all the site workers, and not just the senior management going to these people um, and just trying to fob them off. So it was a, it was a, it was a full package, uh, if that's the way I could put it, okay? So a high performance team, um, again, you could say this is a little bit cliched, um, but I would say on this project, yet again, um, we did implement a high-performance team from the start. <clears throat> um, in my view, the design team uh, were very, very effective, very proactive, but you need more than a design team to deliver a project. You need a high-performing client, you need a well-informed client, you need a well-informed tenant, um, particularly on a project like this where the tenant is very much involved from the get-go there's a commercial transaction taking place. They have certain expectations in terms of fit out and program, and we have to deliver it as a project manager. So um, I think we had a full, um, highly performing team here, right from the client to the tenant, down to the contractor, uh, the project team, and all the sub-consultants. So I think that was a, a very, very good, um, it was a good result on this project. The third, the, sorry, the second last bullet point there, just about BCAR and BC, BCMS and DC, DCC building control. As I'll say later on, there were a number of planning applications required on this project. Um, there was fire certs required, there was DAX required, and it got quite complex. Um, but the one thing that didn't change was the program. The program was the program was the program. So irrespective of whatever hurdle we met in terms of a planning application or an additional information request, the program never changed. So that was one constant on this project. And I would have to say, uh, from my own perspective, uh, the design certifier on the project was very, very proactive, but not just being proactive, it was actually developing a really strong relationship with DCC building control so that they understood the complexities of the project that we were being put under and that they would work with us. So um, one key lesson learned there is that, uh, in my view, you know, your assigned certifier is part of the project team, but they also need to develop a very, very strong relationship with the local authority in terms of a relationship when you need to, for example, move your completion date, uh, or you may need to move it four or five times as we did. You need to have that established relationship there to go back to the building control officer and get their buy into that. Okay, we'll keep moving on. So the next um, topic I was just gonna try and cover is health and safety. Um, I don't stand up here as a health and safety expert, so the, some of this, a lot of this information has been put together uh, by Ashview and fairness to them as the PSDP on the project, but I will, I will feed into this as we go. Um, this was a significant project uh, in terms of the safety file requirements. I think from memory we had possibly about 4,700 uh, pages uh, within the safety file uh, that we ended up with from a landlord and tenant perspective, and the file had to be split then as well uh, in terms of access requirements. Um, we did require multiple workshops probably in the last um, probably last eight weeks or so of the project to try and pull together the safety file, but to also manage people's expectations in terms of what will be in the safety file, um, what should be in a safety file, and what are nice to haves, okay? Um, so we did have to, I wouldn't say educate, but we did have to inform the client and the tenant as to what we could deliver within the time scale and what we could deliver in terms of nice to haves, um, which weren't a statutory requirement for the safety file after PC. Um, the workers' health on the project was very key. 
as you can imagine, this program was so aggressive that there were multiple activities going on and multiple trades constantly, um, which increases the risk of something happening on site, irrespective of all your strict controls and your measures. So um, we had very tight controls on site. We had, in my view, excellent coordination between the PSDP and the PSCS, which you don't always get on all projects, okay? Because sometimes um, the PSDP, somewhat as part of the design team, can feel or can seem to be a little bit separated from the PSCS, who's generally the, the main contractor. But in this instance, there was a much more, let's say, a blending um, of the roles and responsibilities. People had clear lines of demarcation, but there was definitely a good, uh, a good can-do attitude between uh, both parties in terms of PSDP and PSCS. Um, the last two bullet points there, <coughs> another, another hurdle we had in this project was um, the uh, uncover uncovering um, of some um, asbestos material. Um, this was picked up relatively late, I would say, in, in the project, in that it was only picked up probably, I'd say, maybe two-thirds the way through the demolition contract. Um, it put upon us a lot of challenges, uh, but we, we dealt with it. Uh, we consulted with the HSA, and we came up with a, what I believe was the only plan of attack in terms of encapsulating the floor because the, the other alternative was to completely um, stop the project, clear, clear it out, and lift up all of the material, which probably would have taken, I think, maybe 12 weeks, 12 to 16 weeks. That, was, that wasn't the runner. But what we did do was fully signed off by the HSA. We did consult with the landlords, and we consulted with the landlords' insurers as well, which is very important, because when you're making a decision like this, no one wants to make a decision when it involves asbestos, if it's potentially going to impact you know, the future value of, of the asset. Uh, which we, we weren't, we didn't want to go into that territory. So we consulted with the right people in that regard. Um, there's loads more things I could say in health and safety, but this is just a quick snapshot. Statutory approval. So this is more of a fact sheet, okay? So it's not necessarily lessons learned, it's more setting the scene, okay? So as I said, we had five planning applications uh, on the project, and we also had a section five submission, and we had a planning wrap up. So eff effectively, we have six planning applications. We had a fire cert lodged in October. Uh, the 27th now just bear in mind we took site well Flynn's took site occupation on the 12th of October so we lodged the fire cert approximately two weeks later and uh, we only received it in February so you can imagine the pressure we were under and the risks that we had to take um, albeit them calculated on the project to try and work within the constra constraints of what we thought we would receive from the fire officer okay um, just there in terms of in terms of B car, I think I've 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 mentioned B car uh, for now, so I think it was a very very effective strategy on site, an excellent consultation with DCC. Uh, we did have to have, as you would expect, a very aggressive planning strategy, uh, and when I say aggressive, it was aggressive in a in a professional and a directed way, um, and our plan our planning consultants were very much um, in tune with what DCC were looking at, uh, and what we required from the project. So uh, I think that worked very well. Um, and the last point there as well, which maybe, go, maybe goes a little bit um, untold on projects, there was a requirement, and thank goodness we got this on the project for a very strong relationship between your assigned certifier, the design lead, which is the architect you know, on most projects, and the planning consultant to ensure that everybody understands the planning strategy and the risks that come with that, so that everybody understands when someone's making a decision that everybody in, is in the loop. So on this project, it wasn't sufficient just for the planning consultant to give us advice and we move on because the implications of any decision on this project had to be fully understood and digested by all. So I think there was a very good uh, relationship with those three uh, consultants on the project. Okay, sustainability. We did start out this project um, seeking lead gold uh, and that's what was in the AFL from my memory. Um, but as the design progressed, um, 1970s building stock does give you a lot of opportunities to try and seek a very sustainable building in terms of the reuse of materials. And we did target lead platinum, um, and we did achieve lead platinum, albeit we're still waiting for the cert from the US Green Building Council, which is taking an age to receive. But anyway, we're, we're told we've received it and we will get it in due course. Um, and we, we achieved various BER levels from B1 to B3. Um, just some of the lessons learned. Um, there needs to be a timely issue of the information from the consultants to the lead consultant to, to help them manage the process for achieving lead certification. And also, design team members uh, are required to upload information to the US Green Building Council website. Um, <clears throat> at construction stage, 
you obviously need regular information from your contractor and your subcontractor issued to your lead consultants um, on a regular basis so that we can keep the program because there's various there's various milestones and touch points to achieve lead certification as you go through the project so you don't just gather all the information and send it all in prior to pc there's there's a uh, there's sign offs required at design stage and i think there's two or three sign offs required at construction stage so uh, it's not it's not sufficient to gather the information at the end and you need a lot of photographic evidence as you go through the process from the start as well um <clears throat> The last bullet point there, just to dwell on that, that you do need a dedicated lead champion for the project from the contractor, which we had, which helped. So you, you do need an owner, um, which was very helpful on this project. So some points about coordination of, sorry, about 1970s buildings. So some of the nuances that we uncovered, and I'm sure it's the same for other 1970s building stock uh, in the city centre. So coordination of architectural finishes and ME services uh, is very important because obviously they wouldn't achieve the required building codes that we need today. So that's very important. Um, like in any building, but particularly in this building, what's underneath? Have you got the time to do the required surveys? Um, what's the stability of the structure like? Uh, is there contaminants? Is there structural defects? We spoke a little bit about program challenges there. So uh, we did have to seek a revised fire cert. Um, and that, that obviously impacted the program as well. So that was, that was probably more a program challenge rather than a 1970s challenge. Fire codes, we did have to do some extra investigation with Michael Slattery's in terms of the cover to the rebar. What were we achieving with the existing structure? Um, <clears throat> and we weren't, we weren't achieving enough uh, in essence. So we did have to provide some remedial works to, the, uh, to, the, to some of the floor slabs in certain areas. Um, and you know, again, from a fire engineering perspective, how many fire escapes have you got? What will the fire officer accept and what have you looked for in your fire cert submission? Um, we, had a, we had a lot of significant structural modifications as you've probably seen from the pictures to date uh, to achieve um, what we needed in terms of the fit out and what we would need to achieve uh, certain code standards. Okay, moving on. <coughs> uh, specifically in relation to Cumberland House, uh, we had a block and plank floor which was difficult from two perspectives from my own view. One in terms of trying to hang under slab services, uh, which was difficult uh, because you had to um, set them out exactly where you wanted them to be. And also cumbersome in, per in terms of providing um, hubbles. Now, if you're, if you're not aware of what a hubble is, it's basically a stainless steel circular insert into the floor, which facilitates data, power, cabling through it. Um, so it's in lieu of a raised access floor. So we used a, we used a hubble um, construction here on this project. I can't remember how many hubbles there were, but there was probably there was probably 50 or 60 per floor. So um, there, was, there was a couple of hundred, and they took a lot of time to install, and they took time to get um, signed off then as well from a fire perspective. Okay, so that, that was definitely an issue. Um, 1970s buildings, they generally have low floor to ceiling height, which we encountered. Um, they wouldn't have the same tolerances in terms of setting out that we would expect uh, in today's construction. And as we encountered, uh, a lot of them will have asbestos, so you need to be very, very careful that you carry out the right surveys uh, in, in good time prior to starting on site. Um, and the terminal properties don't necessarily comply with today's standards either. So just moving on, uh, we touched a little bit on ground conditions. We did encounter um, some ground conditions issues, um, and there is generally some contamination around the Grand Canal Basin if you do have projects around there. Um, there was an existing drainage um, network uh, around and under the building but it did need to be upgraded so again you, you need to watch out for that um, it is very good and it was very helpful that a lot of the team probably the majority of the team involved in the project did have a good experience of this type of project that they weren't new to a significant refurb with demolitions of a 1970s building so that was very very helpful um, just touching a little bit there in, in, into cost and um, costs were a huge challenge on this project as I'll touch on later on, it was a management contract, and I'm sure we're all very much aware. Management contract, it was a bespoke management contract, but in this instance, it was used to get us a start on site early, as early as possible. The converse of that is that the design was far from complete, um, and if the design is far, com far from complete, the costs are far from being set either. So there was a lot of challenges in there in, ter in, there in terms of setting budgets uh, at the right level. And in fairness, we were always playing catch up in terms of cost management, but we did have structures in place for that. And the asbuilt information on the project was sketchy. It was, it was a building dating back to the 1970s. So you can imagine the safety file wasn't uh, particularly uh, of much use. Um, 
these type of buildings they often have a short program a short program and an aggressive program to get from detail design um, into construction and in this project we've very little time um, for meaningful and, and real coordination uh, i think we did a very good job but we we're always under pressure in terms of design coordination and getting the right information to the contractor at the right time okay um, as a as a consequence of that we had to work out a lot of alternatives and a lot of compromises along the way okay um, I would say to try and minimize um, from a design perspective and a construction perspective you need to try and minimize the amount of buried services that you're proposing for the project unless you have the luxury of time to do significant surveys prior to occupation and, and uh, possession of the site which we didn't have in this instance Cumberland House is a pile structure and uh, I'm sure our engineers who are out there will, will remember uh, many a long and a late day trying to work out solutions uh, with pile foundations and trying to work around them and get uh, uh, lift shaft and lift cores um, constructed and designed in around existing pile foundations. It was a, it was a real headache. We've touched on BCAR and we've touched on the fire cert as well, which needs meticulous management and a really good relationship with the fire officer, which I think we would all say is the same on all projects. Utilities, with a lot of challenges on utilities, uh, again, the program, we thought we were in a good position on utilities because we really started the process probably in January, February 2016, eight to nine months out from PC. We lodged early applications, or what we thought were early applications, with Gas Networks Ireland, uh, and then after that with ESB, um, and then with AIR from a, a phone and a fibre perspective. We did encounter issues with Gas Networks Ireland, um, we, as we said there on the third bullet point, we paid the quote in February 2016. We achieved gas on on the 15th of August. Now remember, PC, which I should have said at the start, was the 1st of September. So you can imagine a project of this size, 13,000 square metres, um, over 450 workers on site, and we achieved gas on with two weeks to go. So you can you can work out the issues that we have with that. So we had, we had serious challenges. And we, too, we didn't have one gas supply to site, we had two gas supplies to site, one for the landlord, and one for the tenant, which is primarily serving the tenant kitchen, okay? <coughs> ESB, uh, we, we managed, well, we, we, we had a slightly better success on that. We were only one month late in terms of achieving power on, uh, which we all dealt with quite well, and the contractor managed that very well. So um, that was a, I wouldn't say it was a win, but it was probably a win in the context of this project and the program pressures. Um, air and telephone lines and broadband uh, is, is another is another issue altogether. We, we encountered serious delays in that regard. Uh, we had to deploy a GSM line to commission the lifts, as we've probably all done previously, but um, we encountered serious delays, uh, suffice to say, in trying to secure phone lines into the site. One of the issues there um, in relation to gas and, and air, these two bodies, they, they, they seem to change their process midway through our project, unfortunately, in terms of securing ESB supervision on site. Um, they didn't inform us of that change, and there was a further delay in trying to get drawings from service providers who we required on site to supervise works by others. Okay, so that was a, that was an issue that we had to encounter. Um, and the overall mitigation there, just early workshops, we thought we had it cracked in February, but um, I suppose if we didn't start then, we, we probably wouldn't have achieved PC either. A few notes just on contract. So as I said, it was a management contract. Um, I believe it was probably the only contract form we could have used to get a start on site as quickly as we required. You don't get cost certainly, as we all know, with a management contract. Um, there was very limited detailed information at tender stage as we entered into a management contract with fluent management and contractors. Um, and the other, the, the, the second last bullet point there, just in terms of an AFL, uh, we had a, a detailed AFL on this project, which um, was being developed and signed, let's say, um, in parallel with the building contract. And there was similar and different requirements in both documents. So the lesson learned there is that as a project team, you need to fully understand, read, uh, and digest the requirements of the AFL and the building contract, um, certainly in terms of any gaps that you see in them and what your, what your responsibilities are to deliver on that. So it's very, very important, okay? Um, and collateral warranties, just a small note there at the end. Uh, we did encounter an issue where uh, the tenant's name, I think it was the name, was... Uh, very slightly wrong on the collateral warranties um, after they've all been sent out and, and signed. So that's a lesson learned. Just double check and maybe triple check the address and the name of, of collateral warranty details uh, before they go out. Okay, I won't dwell too much on this. But there's a lot of information here on this slide. Suffice to say, we've 18 um, order of magnitude cost exercises by KSN. 
so you can probably understand then the challenges that they were under under to try and get cost certainty and um, if such thing is possible on on, on, uh, on a management contract very little detail at the start um, the enabling works we did we did terminate that contract slightly early to get Flynn's an earlier start on site and then Flynn's picked up the works that were left from that enabling works contract so again in hindsight it was the right move to get the main contractor on site um, I think we got them on site maybe two weeks earlier than, than they had thought but that that actually helped us in the end um, the third last bullet point there just a the quantum of works we had over 70 works packages uh, being designed and procured concurrently which will give you an idea of the scale of the task that KSN and Flynn's and the team faced. Okay. Just moving on. Um, the second bullet point there, maybe just to dwell on that for a little minute. Uh, the majority of works were completed from January to September 17. Um, what should I say, September 16. A year ahead of ourselves. So January to September 16. Uh, so we had monthly valuations of up to 5 million uh, plus, which is in my view, very, very significant, certainly for a, re for, for a refurb project with certain new build elements. So um, that was the scale of the task that we faced. We've spoken about planning and fire cert, which we had some delays on. So we had the planning of a month on all the planning applications. So there's another month that we, we I wouldn't say we lost on a project, but certainly impinged us on making uh, real, real progress. And we did have to proceed with some works at risk calculated risk but we did have to proceed with some works at risk but that was with the buy-in of the landlord and the tenant okay and um, cost did suffer uh, in terms of the program because the program was the main deliverable for the project cost did suffer and um, there, there, there's no two ways to say that Um I might just move on um, okay so just one or two other points just on cost management so all tender packs you know should inc should include your requirement for B car and lead because there are specific requirements as a contractor you will require of your subcontractors in terms of BCAR and LEED. You need to have them written into the contract because otherwise there, there will be issues down the line. Um, specialist vendors. So, you know, if there's a specialist vendor preferred on the project or maybe novated into the project, you need to make sure that that vendor has the adequate team and resources in Ireland, not in some other country around the world that they fly in and fly out. That's certainly a lesson learned I, 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 I learned on this project that they need to have a good dedicated team to the project in Ireland rather than being flown in and flown out. Uh, they need to have the right PI cover and it needs, needs to be aligned to the main building contract requirements or you need to seek in advance some sort of waiver um, from your landlord or tenant, okay? Again, a lesson learned on this project. Um, we had weekly procurement meetings. Well, we had weekly everything on this project to be, to be brutally frank about it. We had weekly workshops, we had weekly design team meetings, weekly site meetings, weekly procurement meetings weekly client reports, um, and then a fortnightly client presentation from a program and cost perspective. So everything was crashed on this project to try and achieve the, uh, the program deadline. Um, the very last bullet point there, which we'll dwell on probably near the end, um, we achieved PC within a week of the original date, which if you had it said to me at the start of August, um, I wouldn't have had much confidence that we would have got in within four weeks of the, of the PC date, never mind a week, but it was a huge effort probably from, well, it was a huge effort throughout, but I'd say significantly from the middle of July right to the end of August, weekends, night shifts, you name it, to, to achieve PC, and we got within one week of the original date, um, and rental income started to, to roll for the landlord, which is which is crucial as well. Um, just very briefly on, on program, um, you've probably got a, got a sense for program as, a, as I've been speaking here this morning. As I say, we achieved PC within one week. Um, the program probably should have been 14 to 16 months in hindsight, um, but in, in this instance, as the project managers, we didn't get to uh, we didn't get to say what the program was going to be. We were told what the program was after the commercial transaction was completed, so uh, that was the that was the hand we were dealt. We just had to deal with it. But I would say in hindsight, um, the project was essentially a 14 to 16 month program delivered in 11 months. Um, is there enough? Is there ever enough time to snag? No, was the answer to that. Um, the project was significantly snagged out uh, at PC, I would say, but for, for such a big building with, um, with uh, a building that was managed as well by the landlord, so Hibernia Reef are actually managing this building. I think it's the first building that they're actually delivering and managing themselves, um, and obviously Twitter are, are, are very are very informed tenant. So um, snagging worked out quite well, but there's, there's a little bit of a way to go, I think, just to finally, finally uh, clear, clear the decks in that regard. Um, 
And another element that we got really squeezed on at the end was um, not so much m and &E commissioning, which we achieved, but it was more m and &E commissioning training, um, systems training for both the landlord, who were actually going to operate and manage the building, and also systems training for the tenant, who you know were, were, are going to be the primary resident in this building for uh, a long time to come, hopefully. So we just simply didn't have the time to complete all that in advance. Um, these are the last couple of slides. So um, this is some tenant feedback, some very good tenant feedback we got both directly from the tenant and from some of my colleagues because um, I probably should have outlined at the start, I was working as the landlord project manager with one of my colleagues and I had two of my counterparts who were working for the tenant. So this is some of their feedback as well. So if there's anything tricky in here, you can blame the guys up in the audience there, right? Um, quite good schedule need to be uh, agreed in conjunction with the joinery drawings. Um, early appointment of all specialist subcontractors, particularly uh, from a joinery perspective is very, very important. Um, the third bullet point, which some of us may or may not have encountered on other projects, um, the, the relationship between AV consultants and the AV installers needs to be sort of tapped into very early days uh, so that both parties understand what's being delivered, what is the design, what can actually be installed. So coordination meetings between the AV consultant, the main contractor and the AV installers from an early stage is very, very important. Um, access control on all doors is a necessary requirement for PC. <laughs> I won't get into the specifics of this, but there's certain people in here in the audience who will understand the, a problem that we encountered at PC where we didn't have access control uh, on a key interface door between the landlord and tenant demise. We did come up with a solution. The solution was a security guard um, put in place very, very quickly. Um, not necessarily the, 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 the preferred option, but um, when you're three or four hours away from PC and you're trying to find solutions, that's what we came up with. So we achieved PC on that basis, but. Uh, I suppose the point there is in future, if you're part of the design team, do carry out a gap analysis to ensure there's access control um, on all interface doors between landlord and tenant demises, and it's agreed with all parties as well. Uh, installation of fibre, well, installation of fibre on this project has been poor to date, unfortunately. Um, we, did, we did put in an early order, or so we thought, but it, it still just hasn't been, hasn't been delivered on. Um, this project had additional security measures, so we did have Bomb proof, bomb proof glass, which is a film we, we placed over the glass at the front. We had bollards in front of the uh, steps to the front reception area as well. That was a function of, of Twitter's um, sort of requirements worldwide from a, from a terrorist threat perspective, which, you know, Dublin is not, uh, do doesn't, uh, doesn't get away from that either, okay? Uh, landlord stairs should be locked off when complete to prevent damage in the run of the PC. I think that's probably a, an obvious point. Um, and then the last bullet point, <coughs> uh, sufficient time from power onto floors to be allowed for AV installation. Um, AV, as we all know, is one of the last special subcontractors who comes in um, and, and they do get squeezed for time. So you do need to allow some time there for power on uh, to, to all the various um, floors for AV installation. Um, external lighting for terraces to be agreed with tenant as early as possible. Uh, I won't dwell on that. Second bullet point, which we probably all encounter in most projects, is the early handover of comms rooms. Uh, very, very important. <coughs> we achieved it quite well on this project, and I think we achieved it about six weeks out from PC. Um, I would say there that you should have a formal process for handing over those rooms. That is not just a, a handshake or a nod and a wink between the contractor and the team. You do need a formal process for that, because there will be expensive equipment going into these rooms afterwards, and if there is damage, you need to know who's in control of that room, who's got the swipe card, etc., etc. Um, I touched on the access control there earlier. Um, <coughs> And another point that we, obviously on a multi-let building, which this is, so Twitter is the primary tenant, but we do have MTT on the upper floors. Um, it is very important to agree a process and a protocol at the outset for any subsequent fit-outs to these buildings. So you need to agree the ground rules for you know, a fit-out contractor coming in after the fact to fit out uh, what was essentially two floors above Twitter so that people's expectations and understanding of the works involved uh, are clear from the, from the get-go. Just finally, some thoughts then in dealing with, with US tech firms. So there's obviously a time difference, which is very, very important. So whilst we, we, we might be waning at two or three o'clock, you know, San Francisco's waking up and, and all set to go. So uh, that's a challenge. Um, <clears throat> they don't necessarily like big, long project management reports, which were, were great at writing. They prefer, you know, quick updates, um, shared folders and video conference meetings. Um, they're obviously building in different regions around the globe, so they need to try and develop trust with you as a project manager, as a team, that you know the local landscape, you know the local authorities, and you know the nuances of working, you know, in Dublin city centre, for example. Um, 
Yeah, so Shell and Core, I'll just touch on some of these points. So Shell and Core Design should make full provision for a full cooking kitchen unless you're directed otherwise by your, by your, by your client. So that means risers, drainage, and our soft spots to be placed in the structure. Um, in some instances, we didn't have it on this project because we had an open basement. You should consider maybe a dedicated lift for bicycles to the basement um, and an automated secure door to the bicycle lock. Okay. Um, heavy duty wall protection on back of house corridors, which tend to get a lot of a lot of traffic and a lot of incidental damage. Um, FDI type clients, which we have a lot of, which is great. But they do have um, staff who are very keen to uh, walk to work or cycle. They generally live in around the city centre if they can find somewhere to live. Um, so you need to try and understand that and design in mind with that. Um, glare from roof lights needs to be considered as well. Uh, diverse routes for fibre is obvi obviously very critical depending on who you have coming in in terms of a tenant. Storage of grease uh, is very important. Uh, composting from a waste management perspective and window cleaning which sometimes gets um, forgotten about <coughs> but um, certainly in terms of projects of this significance with a you know a large glazed facade um, and different roof levels you need to try and have a good understanding and an agreement of the window cleaning strategy from the get-go um, and pr particularly in terms of who's going to manage the building at the end they need to be aware of what what they're getting and what they're not getting so just trying to close out good timing a few minutes to go so top five tips i i i don't know where to start with this one i i put a few thoughts down here but this this as i said this could be the top 50 tips i suppose just to try and wrap things up a little bit here today um a clear project objective is very very important now many projects you you'll end up with you know a two or three page document in terms of a, a project charter which will include your project objectives and it may include the usual suspects in terms of time, cost, quality, client expectations, etc., etc., and that's all fine. But um, on this project, uh, we had one clear objective, which was program that was ingrained in all of our brains and bodies from the get-go, um, and it actually helped us deliver. Um, I know we were a week late, but there's all sorts of reasons why we were a week late. But as far as I'm concerned, we we delivered. Um, ex appoint an experienced design team with senior management commitments to the project. So as I said at the start of the presentation, this project benefits from senior management personnel right across the board, including the client personnel, um, fully engaged in the project on a daily and a weekly basis. So if you can get that on your project going forward, that's great. It's not always achievable. Maybe it's not appropriate if you're doing a 20,000 square foot fit out and you, you have time to, uh, to deliver. But if you're on a very, very aggressive project, uh, you do need senior management buy-in, but not buy-in from sitting at their desk for four and a half days a week, buy-in actually being on site and actually making decisions. Um, develop a high-performing team uh, and use effective and appropriate communications and engender a can-do attitude. I think that's probably self-explanatory, I hope. Um, <clears throat> understand, interpret and communicate the client tenant expectations to the full team. Similar to the project objective, know what you need to do and when you need to do it by, okay, in, in, in very, very simple terms. And then the last bullet point, as a project manager, I had to try and close out and program somehow. So um, I suppose, you know, you need to challenge the project, the project program all of the time. You need to understand what's deliverable. You need to be very clear back to your client intended if something isn't deliverable and what you're going to do to try and mitigate that. And you also need to have a good understanding of um, and you need to show good responsibility in terms of delivering on a program that may not be achievable and may be bringing too much health and safety risk on the project. Um, there was one instance on this project where we did have too many trades working uh, in a lift shaft area. Um, through no fault of anybody, it was planned out, all the risk assessments were in place, but we, we, had, we had a near miss um, and we decided as a team then that the program was just being pushed too aggressively and we decided as a team with the landlord to take a step back, uh, we stepped things down for a day or two. We just, you know, refocused the project and we went again. So, I suppose as a project manager, yes, you need to deliver on the program and, and deliver hard, but you need to have an understanding and a, re and a respect for all the different trades on site and what, you, what you're actually asking people to deliver. Is it achievable? So, that's it. I think I've done enough talking there. I hope you've enjoyed that. And any QA, once they're not too difficult, I uh, welcome them. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Now I'll go back to work. <coughs> David. <laughs> Two questions. One, if another project similar to that came up in the near future, what one thing would you address differently? I, 
what is the one thing in your mind that you learned from that project? Okay, um, I think I'm on holidays for the next one. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, if one came up again, what would I do differently? Um, good question. Um, I, I think we did a lot of good things on this project. Uh, we, we had a very, very strong team. Um, I suppose maybe what I might do is maybe temper the ambitions and the expectations of, of both landlord and tenant a little bit more and a bit more regularly. Um, I'm not saying that we didn't keep the tenant and the landlord informed, but maybe we could have just tempered our ambitions in terms of, yes, we can deliver on programme, but there is trade-offs, uh, significant trade-offs in terms of potentially longer to snag out. Um, costs are continually under pressure and the project will not end up at the budget that we set. So maybe in terms of tempering people's ambitions uh, and their expectations, uh, maybe is one thing I'd do differently. What was the second part of the question, David? First one was what you would do differently, the second one was what you learned. What I learned? Um, Mainly sure I learned is that, that a really high performing team can deliver, I wouldn't say almost anything, but can deliver on a really, really demanding project. Um, so I think, and again, it sounds a bit cliched, but I think the fact that we had a really strong team on this was probably the only reason we actually got to the finish line uh, within a week of where we were supposed to be. So, okay. <coughs> yes. Yeah, um, well, there, there, was, there, was, there was a couple of, let's say, delays along the way. Um, I suppose the, the first significant delay we encountered was the, the uncovering of the ACM material. That was a real unknown. Um, maybe, if, maybe if we'd done more surveys beforehand, or maybe if the landlord had done more surveys on purchase in the building, they would have uncovered that. They didn't. Um, we, reacted, we reacted quite quickly, but we did lose time on that, and we lost time throughout the project on that because... We couldn't just encapsulate the whole building. We had to do it floor by floor. And we still had a program. We were still trying to get a contract signed up. So that was the first hurdle that we had to um, overcover, the significant one. The next significant one that comes to mind was the planning delay. We had additional information request on, I think it was the first or the second planning application, which threw us off by four weeks. Um, so that wasn't, uh, that wasn't helpful. After that, the thing that really got us was the quantum of work. You know, just the sheer amount of work to do when you're when you're when you're spending over five million a month on essentially a refurb. Yes, there was new build elements, but essentially a refurb five million a month is is a lot in my view. Um, so there was big ticket items, and then there was a lot of niggles along the way, if you want to put it that way. So, Anne. Um, <clears throat> there wasn't really in, in essence on you know the, the project was quite clear from the outset um, and the AFL was very clear in what it demanded us, of us and what Twitter were looking for so um, we were quite clear in terms of the minimum that we had to deliver um, and the preferred solution so there was there was intricacies in the AFL there in terms of the minimum amount of floor area we had to deliver and um, if we couldn't deliver on the full project um, and I won't get into specific figures, but if we couldn't deliver on what Twitter wanted uh, in terms of the full picture, we had to deliver potentially a half of that and then build a temporary entrance and get them access to the building, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we had to have consideration for that along the way, but I think from a high level, the scope was always quite clear. There was challenges along the way, but the, the scope was quite clear. Um, and we, 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 tried to put a, we tried to put a stop on changes a couple of months out, so, okay. Yes. Really good presentation. Thank you. Just made it worth my trip. Could I ask you one thing? The um, collaborative IT tools that are used by the team, like mm. maybe uh, how did yeah. that work out? I'm thinking particularly at mm. Car and information, and just huge volumes yeah. of information is shared mm. there between stakeholders. C could you comment on that? I can. Yeah. Yeah. We we on? used we used Asite on this project, so. Um, we had A-Site on the project. Uh, we had it agreed with Flynn's as well. So we, we, we rolled it from design, which was a short period, into, into construction stage, which also included design. So A-Site was the base tool we used. 
Uh, and then obviously when I3PT came on board, they had their Cert Central system, uh, which worked very well. Um, I would say from, from I hope there's no one in the room from A-Site, but um, from, from an RFI perspective, A-Site didn't work great uh, on this project. Um, it, it worked okay. Uh, but I think when you twinned A-Site in with the Cert Central tool, there was good control mechanisms there to manage the project uh, quite well. So, um, yeah, I, I think it worked quite well. I, I think the tools probably worked as well as any project would have uh, with such a tight timeline. Um, so we, we, we didn't have BIM or anything like that on, on this project. It was just all 2D. Um, but I, I think A-Site, while it's been critical there in terms of RFIs, it was probably as good as any tool for this project. But things are developing quite well, I think, in, in, you know, in terms of common data environments um, and I3PT tools. Uh, and I think there's a blending now together of these various tools, which I think soon enough will bring together a common data environment, management of technical submittals, RFIs, safety file requirements. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of different parts to that at the moment, but I think they are starting to come together with certain providers, which will be helpful to get a, let's say, a, a one-stop shop in that regard. Okay. Yes. Um, obviously prelims wouldn't have been less, but I, I think uh, I think it probably would be without getting into the commercial sensitivities of it. Um, I think the costs where they may end up probably would be less if we did have an extra two months on the project. Um, it's it's hard to look into the crystal ball, but um, I think they probably would have ended up uh, potentially less. Yes, but as you know yourself, when you have a date to work to, you work to it. Uh, whether whether specifically two months would have gained us two months on the project, I don't know. An extra two months on the project may have, in reality, only gained us four weeks. You know, uh, because unfortunately on this project, well not unfortunate, but by the end of August, I can tell you from from the contractor, the subcontractors, and the team, everybody was burnt out, um, and I don't think you would have got people to work another two months. <laughs> they would have been on a Ryanair flight out of here, and I would have been with them. Come on. Uh, Thank you. Um, I think it would have ended up in court if it didn't end up uh, a success. So I think there was only two options on this project. Um, it was either delivered successfully by the teams or we would have been um, probably all dragged through the courts uh, by, by both potential landlord and tenant for the next two years. So I think it was very clear. Um, I think we all understood where the lines of demarcation were. We all act, act professionally. Even though your colleague beside you, you might have been launching a grenade at him. Um, you still had to do it. You had to do your job because we, we had different paymasters. So... Um, I think there was only two options. Good, good, strong Chinese walls. Okay, okay, is that it? Okay, thanks very much. Okay, just want to thank JP for a very, very interesting um, presentation. Um, thank you all for coming along this morning, and uh, hopefully we'll see you all uh, soon. Thank you.